Hello and welcome to our special coverage of Putin's power play. I'm Stan Grant. Eastern Ukraine has crossed the brink. European leaders are waking up to a very dark day, claiming Russia has already sent tanks and troops into eastern Ukraine. Vladimir Putin calls it peacekeeping. The UK has already called it an invasion. The US and the UK have promised swift and severe sanctions, but President Putin has already made that calculation. Ukrainian President Zelensky addressed the nation saying, we will not give away anything to anyone. At the moment, there are conflicting reports of minor border skirmishes. Well, Russia formally recognised two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine as independent. Now, the disputed areas of Donetsk and Luhansk in the Donbass region sit on the Russian border. They were proclaimed in 2014 when Russian-backed separatists fought Ukrainian troops in a civil war. Donetsk is the fifth largest city in Ukraine and home to more than one million people. The UN Security Council held an urgent late-night meeting in New York where multiple nations called for peace and diplomacy efforts to try to avoid a war. Ukraine's delegate described Russia's move as illegal. Today, the entire membership of the United Nations is under attack. Under attack by the country that occupied the membership of the Security Council in 1991 by passing the UN Charter. The country that occupied parts of the territory of Georgia in 2008. The country that occupied parts of Ukraine in 2014. As stated by the President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, following the urgent meeting of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine, the internationally recognized borders of Ukraine have been and will remain unchangeable. Regardless of any statements and actions by the Russian Federation. The ABC's Europe correspondent, Nick Dole, is in Kiev. He joins me now. Nick, what are people saying there? I understand. Well, some people certainly say they're shocked, but many people aren't entirely surprised because many Ukrainians say they've predicted this kind of a strategy from Vladimir Putin. They say that they have seen it before. Um, and I think among many Ukrainians, especially after watching Vladimir Putin's speech overnight here, uh, there will be a growing sense of defiance because in that wide ranging speech, he, he took the opportunity to really attack the very notion of Ukrainian statehood. He was essentially portraying this place as a, a feeble place full of neo-Nazis, he said. It was extremely corrupt and really in need of Russia's guidance. And uh, as we know, Vladimir Putin has previously said that this is personal for him. He regards the fall of the Soviet Union as a great catastrophe. And I think in that sense, people are concerned about what might happen next because uh, they don't know whether Vladimir Putin will be rational. Yes, the international community has said, if you go an inch further, especially if you launch a full-scale uh, invasion of Ukraine, there would be great cost. Uh, but because it is so personal for the Russian president, I think people here are really unsure what decision he'll take next. And I suppose I must be wondering just how far this goes. Um, we're already hearing from Boris Johnson of a catastrophic conflict and the potential of a full-scale invasion. But why Donetsk and Luhansk? And tell us about the makeup of those areas and why that is so important to Vladimir Putin. So Donetsk and Luhansk have been held by pro-Russian rebels since 2014. Since then, there has been uh, a period of uh, varying conflict. It's been uh, flaring, especially in the last few weeks during all of this. These areas uh, held by the pro-Russian rebels are an opportunity for Vladimir Putin to continue exerting some control uh, in Ukraine's politics. Now, he, in doing this, uh, has paved the way in, in, in uh, declaring these areas as independent, he is paving the way for Russia to get involved. Russia has been issuing, uh, for example, passports to many Ukrainians in those areas. So technically speaking, there are now a lot of Russians living there. Vladimir Putin can now use their presence as an excuse to go in. That's exactly what we've seen. So in the last week, uh, he ramped up the rhetoric around what he called a genocide happening there. Now, 
Western leaders slapped him down for that. But he was paving the way to, to send in these so-called peacekeepers. And that's exactly what he's done. According to the UK, tanks are already in Ukraine's territory. And there are some reports uh, of more military hardware mm. moving into Donetsk and Luhansk. Uh, but, uh, yeah, it's underway from, from the West's perspective. Thank you, Nick. Nick Dole joining us live there from Kiev. So with the stroke of a pen, Russian President Vladimir Putin ordered peacekeeping, as he calls them, troops into Donbass. In a fiery televised address to the nation, he argued Ukraine has no history of being a true nation. The essence of the aggressive nationalistic character of the regime that seized power in Kiev hasn't changed. I consider it necessary to immediately recognize the independence and sovereignty of the Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. Well, joining me now live from the Russian capital is Pyotr Sauer from the Moscow Times. Good to have you with us. So. We know how Vladimir Putin has framed this. He sees Ukraine as being essentially part of his territory. He has said there is no sovereignty Ukraine for Ukraine unless it is with Russia. Um, and he knows why that particular region. So take us into the calculations that Vladimir Putin will be making. Oh, so at the moment, Putin is thinking um, it's, uh, it's a good time for him to you know, put in these troops into uh, Eastern Ukraine because he didn't get what he sort of asked for with uh, the the security guarantees from the West, which were very much unrealistic. He did. Ukraine said they didn't want to sit down on the Minsk agreement. NATO said that they will keep the door open for Ukraine. So this very much felt like Putin sort of losing out on what he wanted and then just decided to grab uh, Eastern Europe, uh, the the regions in Eastern Europe, in Eastern Ukraine. So, Piotr, there is a lot of speculation about just how far Vladimir Putin mm -hmm. would go. We know what he said in the past and he set out what he believes are his demands in the region, but militarily, is there anything you can glean from what he has said, from actions in the past that may give an indication of just how far this may go? So military experts are pointing to the fact that um, Putin has built up uh, a, a 150,000 troops on the border and he didn't have to do that if he just wanted to recognize uh, those two regions because they're already pro-Russian. He could have just sent in his troops, uh, you know, a smaller army and just uh, sort of claim them. So experts are, are saying, you know, why is he building so much, so many troops? Why is he putting troops in Belarus if he wasn't actually looking for a full-scale invasion? And that's very much what the American intelligence and the UK intelligence has been saying as well. So it's definitely very worrying uh, times. And just how popular a move is this amongst Russian people? Mm -hmm. So this is quite complicated. Obviously, in 2014, when, when Putin annexed Crimea, that was a hugely popular move. 95% of Russians backed that move. Uh, Crimea sort of had these long historical links. The Donbas, it's not, uh, not, not the same. Uh, around 45% of Russians said they would want to see Donbas independent or as part of Russia, but the majority... Uh, doesn't think that's a, a good decision. And I think yesterday's address was very much aimed at telling the Russians why Putin thinks this is the right decision. Uh, but I think once sanctions come in, uh, once the economy gets hit, many Russians won't be happy. And if we see a large scale war, I think that will further uh, anger many Russians because they don't, there's very little appetite in, in a big war with Ukraine. Piotr, thank you. Piotr Sauer joining us live there from Moscow. Well, of course, there's been international condemnation of Russia's move and, of course, threats of severe and swift action, notably sanctions. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson has spoken just moments ago following high-level talks at Downing Street. Let's have a listen. He will come up against something that I think will be very hard for him to beat, and that is the Ukrainian sense of national pride and their determination to defend their country and uh, to fight for it. And I think the, the tragedy of the present situation is that President Putin has surrounded himself with like-minded advisors who tell him uh, that Ukraine is, uh, is, is not a proper country. Uh, and I think that he's going to find that he has gravely miscalculated. Well, Bryce Wilson is an Australian photojournalist. He is in Eastern Ukraine and joins us now Tell us what you've been seeing there today, Bryce. Uh, firstly, I'm really sorry for being late right now, but I've just arrived in a town close to the front line and I can actually hear the sounds of artillery in the distance. Uh, we've been moving closer towards the front line positions and there is a 
significant movement of like military hardware in this area. Uh, I know that the situation is very fluid at the moment. I'm not sure what's going to happen today, but we are going to an area where there's been significant shelling uh, just this morning uh, to find out what's happening, if there has been any impacts on civilians in the area, uh, as well as to uh, inspect damage to local infrastructure. Have you had a chance to speak to, to any people in the area today? Yes, uh, we've interviewed people and honestly, they're shocked that this has happened. Uh, I've spoken with people in Kyiv and they, for them, uh, Putin's speech last night, uh, essentially saying that Ukraine is not an independent country, that even the concept of Ukraine does not exist. Uh, people here are absolutely shocked by these events. And I'm, I'm seeing too, as we get closer to the, the front line, the streets are getting emptier. The, there are less people here. You can see there are cars and everything driving around. But uh, in the city where I was living in Kramatorsk, people are starting to leave. Uh, one of my friends is preparing to evacuate his family from this area because they are concerned that as a result of the uh, occupied territories, essentially uh, making a, a legal claim to the whole state, not just Sorry, not just where the uh, the current front line is, but the whole state. They're really uh, fearful and afraid that there will be a mass invasion in this whole area. Uh, Bryce, as someone who spent a lot of time in the region, just give our viewers here in Australia a sense of the area itself. Now, Vladimir Putin talks about a higher ethnic Russian population. We know that there are these, these provinces, the areas that he's going in, he says, to bring peace to and support their independence. Uh, a breakaway areas that under the Minsk agreements, there were commitments to their own self-governance. So how do the people see themselves in the region? What is that sense of independence? and how do they look to Russia and to Ukraine? Uh, the, a very sad thing that I've observed from speaking with people here is that there really are people that have opinions on both sides of the, the situation. Some people do uh, identify closely to Russia. Some people uh, say to me that after eight years, the people living in government-controlled areas, they don't feel like they're part of Ukraine anymore. Uh, the economic situation is uh, the economic situation here is very bad. Uh, after eight years, much of the civil infrastructure in this area has. Sorry, I'm just hearing more shelling. Uh, mm. The infrastructure here has fallen into disrepair. Uh, some people genuinely do uh, identify more closely with Russia and recall very, very fondly times when maybe they had a more, uh, I guess, affluent sort of lifestyle when things weren't as bad as they are now. But uh, the, the one thing I've learned from working here for so long is everyone has a different opinion. Everyone has a different, mm. I guess, belief in what they want. And uh, in many places, families have been divided by the front line. Uh, people have lost jobs. They're not able to cross the, the crossing points. Uh, it. I know uh, this situation, it's very dynamic and fluid, but everything that's going on right now is surreal to me. And when I speak to people, I think honestly they're in shock by what has occurred last night. And just finally, I, I don't want to keep you there too long because you say you're here in shelling and I can see you potentially quite exposed there as well. But from someone who has covered the region, and again, to give us a sense here of what the region is like itself, what the terrain is like and how accessible it is, to, to Russian troops coming into the region? So uh, the step in eastern Ukraine is incredibly flat. Uh, previously, when I've been here and there have been battles, uh, so you can see four or five kilometers away. So uh, what I'm expecting, if there is a, an invasion in this uh, territory, there will be mass, uh, mass implementation of tanks, heavy artillery. Uh, you can uh, be struck 40 kilometers behind the front line. Uh, People have said that they won't be able to move armored vehicles unless uh, the ground is frozen. That's not the case. A lot of the roads in these areas are still very good. Uh, I've observed on the roads significant evidence of armored vehicles. I've seen uh, the Ukrainian armed forces moving more vehicles and equipment closer to the front line. Uh, this area has seen war already for eight years. And I think both sides have learned and observed how to conduct themselves here. And, to be honest, uh, warfare in urban environments is incredibly brutal. And I, uh, I'm incredibly, I don't want to say afraid, but I'm mm. not sure what's going to happen over the next 24 hours. And uh, 
this could be a catastrophic series of events. Yeah, indeed. Look after yourself there as well. Again, we don't want to keep you too much longer. Thank so you. Thank and you again, again Thanks, apologies for the delay. Not, not at all. Not at all. Thank you. Let's take a look now at the big picture here to try to join the dots to what we're seeing and where this may go. Joining me is Associate Professor Alexei Moraviev from National Security and Strategic Studies at Curtin University, the Director of Research at the Lowy Institute, Hervé Lemahieu, and Anastasia Biesiadina, PhD candidate at the University of Sydney Department of Government and International Relations. And Anastasia, I think I'll start with you and, and get a sense of someone who has studied Ukrainian national identity and nationalism, and we've heard from Volodymyr Zelensky saying we'll give up, won't, won't give away anything to anyone. What sort of resistance? How do Ukrainians feel about that sense of identity and the divisions within the country itself? Because it is not homogenous, and there are different groups in different areas with different uh, allegiances. Take us through that. That's right, Luke. That's a very good question, and um, stemming from. You know, the answer that you received from the photo um, journalist, uh, Ukraine is quite a dynamic and diverse population with um, different senses of identity and different political alignment. And I think that needs to be noted. Uh, significantly, what I want to point out is that Zelensky has had a very dynamic and a quite changing uh, rhetoric when it comes to exposing Russia as an aggressor. Now, we've seen uh, within weeks that he may swing back and forth between saying that nothing will happen mm. or uh, an invasion is looming. And this sort of uh, rhetoric stemming from the state definitely has a repercussion on how Ukrainians feel. Now, what we've been seeing in the previous uh, weeks is that Ukrainians are coming out on the streets and protesting against uh, Putin. So we see a lot of activism coming from Ukrainians in civilian society, as well as not only in Ukraine, but we see this motion in international community. So um, as an example, just like yesterday, we saw Ukrainians and Litcom come out on the streets and uh, protest as a way of seeking awareness from the Australian government and international awareness. So um, to answer your question once more, you see a very physical and a visual uh, resistance from the Ukrainian community. Uh, Alexei, um, the, the question, of course, is is why? Why now, given um, the international opposition, significant international opposition that Vladimir Putin uh, has faced, the warnings of sanctions, and then the concern that this could escalate further? Take us through your analysis of what we're seeing now and where it could go. Look, I mean, in terms, in terms of why now, I guess uh, the Russians kind of indicated that they, uh, back, back in December... Because we need to remember, it, it didn't start just with, with the crisis in mm. Ukraine. It started back in July when, uh, 2021, when Biden and Putin met in Geneva, trying to work out questions of strategic stability. And the question of Ukraine popped up then. So that was a, fa a fairly long process that going for over half a year. Back in December, the Russians issued uh, effectively an ultimatum to the United States and NATO, and NATO about their vision for European security, expressing their security concerns, expecting certain type of returns that would provide them with insurances and guarantees. And again, Ukraine featured there, but not, not prominently. It was, it was always being looked uh, by the Kremlin in the context of much broader and more strategic matters concerning the balance of forces on European theater or war, the strategic balance of forces between Russia and, and, and the United States. And Ukraine just happened to be this proxy uh, a proxy area where the collision of this great power interests happened to, to, to occur. Mm. And, and obviously there's been a, 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 a sort of a escalation of fighting along lines of control, separating the Ukrainian uh, government forces and pro-Russian separatists. There's been the end of the Winter Olympics. And there was a lot of speculation whether, whether Putin would wait for, for the Olympics to, to be over, just like he did mm. uh, back in 2014 uh, when he annexed Crimea. And, 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 and clearly, uh, we need to remember that the Russians just finished their large-scale preparation and training, the large-scale exercise that they held together with Belarus, uh, which came to an end on, on 20th of February. So the Russian military is in yeah. standby mode. They warm themselves up. They're ready to go in. Alexei, I want to come back to you in a minute and say, 
in terms of what Vladimir Putin's bigger strategy is and how much territory he may be seeking. But I'll bring Hervé in here because we've already seen from Boris Johnson that there will be a retaliation with sanctions. We know that the United States has said to expect swift and severe consequences. But what will those consequences be, Hervé, and will they be enough? Well, they were not enough. They were uh, to prevent uh, Putin from uh, making this uh, grand uh, opening gambit on, on uh, moving his tanks into the Ukraine over the last 24 hours, beginning with uh, a 55-minute diatribe which start, sought to expunge essentially the existence of, of the Ukraine as a, as a country, as a nation. Mm. Um, so uh, clearly, I think the Russians are feeling quite emboldened. This is a country that um, has experienced waves of sanctions before. You'll recall, uh, stemming back from the uh, initial annexation of Crimea in 2014, they've been successfully, uh, uh, successively ramped up, uh, targeting Russian government entities, businesses, individuals within the circle of Vladimir Putin. But will they hurt more this time, Hervé? And when we, we hear a lot about the Magnitsky Act, for instance, and the way that they target individuals um, and the damage that that can do, how will that be implemented? And can this go to indeed another level to inflict more pain than perhaps even the sanctions that were imposed after the annexation of Crimea? Yes, so I think there are three uh, types of sanctions which could really uh, start to hurt Russia and perhaps Moscow is taking the gamble here that um, the, the West will not escalate to that extent. The first, obviously, is uh, energy exports. So that um, accounts for about 25%. Uh, the fuel and energy sector ac accounts for about 25% of Russia's GDP, 30% of its consolidated uh, government budget. And if uh, the West were to go after uh, Russian energy in a way that hurts Europe first and foremost, um, that would begin to bite. But again, Russia has, since 2017, augmented its national foreign reserves. So mm. that has something like 600, million, 600 billion, billion sorry, yeah. uh, uh, dollars in, in international reserves, which means that it is quite padded from uh, at least the initial blows of, uh, of a Western move against uh, its energy uh, sector. The second type of measure is, of course, against the banking sector. So there's been a, there's been a lot of discussion around perhaps freezing Russia from uh, SWIFT, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, the mechanism by which you handle interbanking messaging globally. So it really is what allows Russia to be plugged into the um, international financial system. Again, uh, there's been reticence on the part of the West uh, to escalate it to that level. There may be targeted sanctions against a number of uh, Russia's uh, largest banks. Um, and then there's a third type of, of, of uh, regime, uh, sanctions regime. This would be really uh, uh, an act of, of cleaning up um, the sort of dirty money in mm -hmm. uh, major global financial centers such as London, such as New York, which have harbored uh, a lot of the uh, dirty money of uh, Russian kleptocrats, w w kleptocrats who are very uh, mm. close to, to Putin, of course. So we'll, we'll have to see whether any of those three things okay. um, really begin to bite. Anastasia, I want to bring you back in. When we look at the um, negotiations and the diplomacy around this, and it still may indeed happen that Joe Biden sits down, he's agreed in principle to a discussion with Vladimir Putin. Is there a sense in Ukraine that Ukrainian sovereignty is a bargaining chip, that part of the, 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 the attempt to stave off uh, the type of war that is being threatened or feared that Ukrainian sovereignty may suffer, particularly when it comes to fundamental things in the Constitution, such as the right to, at some point, join NATO? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. And, you know, something that I've been noticing currently in media, if I may know that um, there is an explicit focus on the geopolitics that are happening that um, take away the significance of the reality of what's, what is happening in Ukraine and thinking about the fate of the Ukrainian people. Um, now, unfortunately, uh, the rhetoric of saying that top leaders are going to use sanctions to scare Putin uh, is unfortunately not working. And as we're seeing this escalation and the unknown of what might happen to Ukrainian sovereignty definitely feels like Ukraine is very vulnerable and it does not have a lot of protection. So it is very frightening to realize that Ukraine falls as a bargaining chip between powerful leaders and there needs to be some form of a light in realizing that at the end of the day, 
Ukrainian lives are at stake, mm. so Ukrainian sovereignty is at stake. And, you know, my family, I have friends in Kiev at the moment, and I have no idea what will happen. And it is truly frightening. Have you spoken to them, by the way? And how, what are they telling you? Yeah, look, my, my mom is overseas. My grandma are overseas. I haven't seen them since COVID happened. So it's been over two years and um, they're in a, in a state of shock and, you know, taking things day by day um, as a way of keeping yourself mentally mm. in check. It's, it's a very nervous situation mm. to be in and so, not knowing what will happen tomorrow. So a lot of a lot of stress, anxiety. Sorry to, to hear that. Um, and my sympathies to your family as well. And, and Alexei, let's look again at the, you know, the hard-nosed politics of this and the calculations of Vladimir Putin. Joe Biden has said he's not putting American troops into Ukraine. Um, NATO is not putting American troops into Ukraine. Anastasia has said Ukrainians feel as if they're, they're a pawn in this. They're part of the bargaining. Uh, they're a bargaining chip. Does Vladimir Putin claim a victory already? And how far does he take this? Oh, is it the, the all-out invasion of Ukraine? How much land does he seek to take? Just where does this go? Look, I think Putin has won, uh, certainly won the initial stage uh, uh, in, in, in terms of actually putting West, uh, the West back on the defensive because the West will have to now to deal with the consequences of, of Putin's actions. In terms of how much, uh, how much he was going to claim, well, let's, let's go back to this, uh, to this uh, floating figure of 150,000 Russian troops. We need to remember that according to NATO stats, about 30,000 of them are stationed in Belarus. Are they there to poise uh, uh, an invasion of Ukraine from, from the country's north? I think they're more there to deter NATO from taking any actions uh, against, against Russia as well as Belarus. So they're there to balance NATO forces stationed in Poland as well as the Baltic states. So that really reduces the number of Russian forces down to maybe 100,000 100, or under 100,000. 100,000 or less, it's not sufficient to exercise significant offensive operation against uh, the, uh, the, the, the country of, of, of Ukraine, especially if we to believe yeah. Russia's claims that the, the Ukrainians have so, messed about 150,000 so, so there might be some limitations there. I've only got about a minute, Harve, but I want to see what's on, what's on the table here for the US and Joe Biden. And China, of course, factors into this as well, given the closer links between Russia and China. Yeah, look, I mean, the, the one, I, th I suppose, silver lining in all this is that I think the United States has learned a few lessons from um, the uh, poorly organized, uh, hasty withdrawal from Afghanistan in August, the lack of consultation with its allies um, in that event, and also the fact that Russia smelt an opportunity. We were talking earlier, why now? Well, because I think Russia smelt uh, in some sense that Washington was weak uh, and not particularly coordinated with uh, its Western partners in Europe. Um, AUKUS would have not uh, helped uh, that, of course, because that was also a famous um, uh, point of tension between France mm. uh, and the Europeans and the Americans. I think what we've seen now between Washington, Brussels, uh, Berlin and Paris is, is at least a, a show of, of unity. And um, I think this will result in, in more purpose uh, for NATO. Yeah. It will result uh, ultimately in, in a U.S. that's far more involved in Europe. Now, what that means for our region, what that means for China is, is a whole other okay. uh, kettle of fish. I'm, I'm going to have to have to leave it on, on that note. But Harvey, thank you so much. Anastasia, good to talk to you and, and the best to, uh, to your family. Alexi, thank you for your insights as well. Now, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison has joined other Western leaders in criticising Russia's decision to send troops into those two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine. He says Australia will support sanctions on Russia as a result. Russia should step back. It should unconditionally withdraw uh, back behind its own borders and stop threatening its neighbours. Um, we've seen this behaviour before and uh, seeking to take opportunity to threaten a neighbour uh, for their own advantage, is just simply not on. It's unacceptable, it's unprovoked, it's unwarranted. Now, one of the most potent weapons in Russia's military arsenal is cyber warfare. Australia has promised to train Ukrainian officials and possibly join a broader coalition of Western countries to provide the besieged Eastern European nation with technical support. Well, joining me now is Greg Austin. He's the head of the program for Cyber, Space and Future Conflict International Institute for Strategic Studies. He joins us now. Nice to have, have you with us as well. Um, can I, I ask you, first of all, about Russia's capability um, its history of, of, of cyber warfare inside Ukraine and where it could take that? 
Well, thank you, Stan. Uh, Russia has been the most aggressive country in the world in terms of offensive cyber operations. Uh, we're about to publish a study that look, compares Russia with the United States and China. So Russia has been the most aggressive country and, the, and Ukraine, unfortunately, has been the country that has suffered most from those attacks. That said, uh, Russian attacks have been rather sporadic. Uh, there were some very significant attacks in 2015, 2016, 2017, including the famous NotPetya attack, which resulted in mm. damage worldwide. But by and large, Russia has not unleashed uh, the full might of its cyber potential. Will it do that now? Uh, we're saying no, based on what we've uh, seen in our case studies and our analysis of Russian cyber operations in the last 20 years. Uh, we think that for some reasons, uh, the leaders don't have full confidence that they can achieve strategic effects with cyberspace operations. So at most, I think Russia will unleash some cyber uh, activity uh, to destabilize, to disorient uh, perhaps the uh, Ukrainian population. But uh, I think what we see is high confidence by Putin and his generals in traditional uh, conventional kinetic military power and lower confidence uh, in cyber power. And what about the, the capacity um, in Ukraine itself to resist? Well, sadly, uh, Ukraine doesn't have very strong cyber security. Uh, it's a very difficult thing to mount national cyber security. You need very strong uh, defense industries, uh, ICT industries, ICT universities. Ukraine has amazing skills in these areas, but hasn't been able to turn them to produce what you might call uh, nationwide cyber security. And in, those, in that environment, uh, Ukraine or any country like that is always prey to the great powers in cyberspace who can more or less operate at will in their systems. What about a country like Australia? Australia has said it's committed to supporting Ukraine, particularly in building this type of capacity to resist this type of cyber attack. What does Australia have to offer? What can we do? Well, we can uh, make a symbolic contribution at this stage. Building cybersecurity is something that takes 10 or 20 years. Uh, so uh, Australia, the United States, the UK, any of the countries that are now offering help uh, will be able to help with incident response, but they won't be able to do much to build up the uh, Ukrainian self-defense capability. So it's easier for the United States or Australia to send in uh, military equipment. So anti-tank missiles will have far more effect um, on Ukrainian resistance than anything uh, the friendly countries can offer in cyberspace. Greg, great to get your insights as well. Greg Austin, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Stan. Now, as news of Russia's move to recognise rebel-held areas hit the streets of Kiev, many in the streets of the Ukrainian capital were in disbelief. But some say they will defend their country. I don't like it at all. I think the peace Vladimir Putin or Russia will offer to Donetsk and Luhansk won't be the same as Ukraine could offer. They won't have banks working. It would be like in Crimea, but much worse. I can't even believe that uh, the major of that city is uh, come into the TV and said what they said. So um, they betrayed our country. How can you stay when there are shootings all day? Would you wait for something to strike your window? I don't want it. Even in my age, I want to live. Well, there are fears of a humanitarian crisis in eastern Ukraine. Florence Gillette is the Red Cross head of delegation in Ukraine, and she joins us now from Kiev. What are you, thank you, first of all, for, for joining us, but what, what are you preparing for? Uh, good evening, Stan. Uh, we are actually not only preparing, we are actually already uh, seeing huge, uh, what significant humanitarian consequences um, um, that follows the last five days uh, of escalation in hostilities, and we are already starting to respond, but some of the response will be challenging. What we, are seeing, what we have seen in the last five days is a significant impact by shelling and hostilities on the water network in Donetsk region at first, and that continues. And uh, yesterday we started to see significant impact in Lugansk region. We already have hundreds of thousands of people who are struggling with access to water. And we know that uh, possibly uh, hundreds of thousands more are going to uh, face major issues in access to water in uh, as of Thursday, Friday this week. Uh, so we are trying uh, also right now, we have a t teams uh, going to uh, on one side distribute uh, drinkable water 
uh, in some of those locations, but also we're working very uh, closely with water companies to try and, and find uh, solutions to repair uh, or find alternative solutions quickly uh, to uh, the situation. However, um, it's going to be very complicated mm. because those are major water networks. And, and just on that, Florence, and because you've talked about water, obviously there's going to be food and other assistance, people potentially, or they will, in fact, no doubt, be, be, be left homeless, um, impact on children. There's going to be, sadly, people wounded um, and possibly worse out of this as well. And you talked about the challenges. What are the challenges in getting access and getting those, those need, that, that support to where it's most needed? Right now, the access is security because they are, uh, and the shelling has been quite intense uh, for uh, since Thursday, I would say. Uh, so we have to uh, try and operate uh, safely to be able to send teams that will not be uh, under shelling when they work, but also uh, to ensure that the population who is there to receive, uh, for instance, uh, this drinkable water today, or the um, workers that are working on water systems, on electricity, and on other systems that are essential to the survival of the population are not hit themselves. So today, our main challenge is navigating security. And, and navigating security, you say, right now, that, that, that is the, the big challenge. Today, uh, if you ask me, really this morning, today, that uh, we, we had again discussion this morning, we decided to send quite a number of teams mm. uh, to con conduct their activities, but it's how we ensure that they are not um, at the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, talking with all the weapon bearers, uh, anticipating, being in close contact with the local population to see uh, that they are not exposed because of our response and that we are not exposed because of our response. And Florence, we know that we're talking about this latest flare-up, but these are people who have lived with this on and off conflict now since 2014. So it's compounding what already exists. Tell us about the impact on people, the mental health of people, the impact on children, the things that people are already dealing with before this latest escalation. Uh, thank you very much, Stan. I think it's really important to, to stress the fact that uh, this, the population in eastern Ukraine have been ongoing, uh, you know, terrible uh, situation for many years. Uh, and some of uh, those impacts have been uh, clearly a major issue in terms of maintaining family links and, and uh, social safety uh, networks uh, that were uh, already um, affected by the hostilities at the beginning of the conflict in 2014-15. Uh, that where family links were difficult to maintain uh, when the line of contact, which is basically the front line uh, that was established um, at the early stages, I would say, of, uh, of the conflict, uh, where people were uh, relying on the support of their families, of their friends to support them, families and friends that were sometimes 20 minutes drive away from them suddenly became one day away. And with COVID-19, and we should not forget mm. COVID-19, it became even worse. So we already have, you know, um, the resilience of the population has been uh, challenged by the fact that they could not rely on this uh, support of families and friends. That's a major problem. The essential infrastructure I was mentioning, water, electricity, gas, have been uh, permanently um, at risk over the last seven years. So uh, water cuts, uh, electricity cuts, gas cuts have been very regular. However, what we've seen in the last five days is a much uh, bigger impact, much wider and more challenging to fix. Yeah. We also have had major economic issues for those um, population because, uh, of course, uh, employment uh, plummeted. I mean, it was extremely difficult uh, in quite a number of places to maintain employment. Um, and we also had people who increasingly had to rely at first uh, on assistance just to survive, as you said, food and, and other mm. items. We tried to support them with microeconomic initiatives, livelihood projects, agricultural projects. But today, those uh, solutions that we had put in place are at risk because of the ongoing hostilities. You mentioned the children, uh, which is a, a major issue. Uh, schools have been regularly targeted. Uh, not necessarily targeted, actually, very often also they were maybe collateral damage of, uh, of hostilities. There are some schools where we had to do repairs four or five times in the last eight years. Uh, we, we worked with the, the school staff 
uh, to ensure that kids are, were trained on how to deal with mine risk, but also mm. uh, done safety drills for the protection. Okay. And in addition to children, I would add elderly, people, uh, older persons, people, uh, disabled persons and people uh, with mobility issues who have really been affected. For, Florence, good luck with the work you're doing and, and uh, I hope all of your workers are able to stay safe as well. Thank you so much, Florence Gillette from the Red Cross in Ukraine. Thank you very much. Tom. Now, the ABC's former Chief Foreign Correspondent, Phil Williams, reported extensively from the region during the Crimea invasion. He joins me now. Watching on, Phil, it brings back memories of when you were there. What does your experience inform you about what we may see play out here? Well, it does seem here we go again. I mean, I saw it from the beginning of the revolution in 2014 uh, in the Maidan in the Independence Square, saw people gunned down. Now, that was Ukrainians gunning down Ukrainians, but they were, they were the police defending the, alliance, the allegiance, the alliance with the Russians against those that wanted a more westward looking uh, view. But what we have here is an invasion and what we have is a president uh, in Vladimir Putin uh, who is going to order his troops, no doubt, uh, to be involved in a conflict uh, that will kill. P there'll be people alive today that will not be alive in a few days' time. Civilians, uh, women, children, old people, uh, relatives, loved ones, uh, these are going to be the victors. What right does any leader have to do that for uh, what is effectively a strategic uh, porn uh, game, of, a game of chess uh, using uh, civilians and using the soldiers of both sides as pawns uh, in, in this massive game of chess in which he's uh, bluffing, trying to bluff, I think, the West. Uh, but now it's come down to a very sharp end. And uh, I fear that there will be a, a significant push from, from the East there and uh, possibly in other areas too, particularly down south near uh, Mariupol. And you know what it's like to, to work on the ground in a situation like that and to be able to get access to people, to be, able to, to be able to find out the truth of what is really happening. How difficult is it working in a place like Ukraine, given the differences in the country, the regional differences, the divisions in the country, the factions, as you say, Ukrainian against Ukrainian, and now you have this presence of Russia, of course, with the potential for a full-scale invasion. Take us through that. It is very complex and it's uh, fraught. And of course, there's no uh, unanimous view in Ukraine. It's, it's a country, a diverse country with diverse uh, views. Uh, but at the core of it is most Ukrainians, uh, the, not the ones in the East, but most Ukrainians uh, want to make those decisions for themselves. They don't want those decisions made on uh, issues like corruption, uh, on, on, their, uh, on their, their problematic power uh, supplies, on all the sorts of things that every country deals with. They don't want that, those decisions made by a man in Moscow, and that's what's happening right now. Uh, there is not a sense of panic there. Uh, but deep concern. And I've just been in communication with a, a friend of mine over there. He said, yeah, we're not, we're, people aren't running around and, and, and hopping in cars and heading for the border necessarily. But since the uh, Russians moved in to uh, Donetsk and Luhansk areas and recognised mm. them as separate countries, now they fe he fears uh, that uh, a, a, a full-scale invasion is inevitable. Phil, we've got just under two minutes, but, but I, and, it, and it's, a big, it's a big question, I, I know, but you, know, you have reported a changing world. You've seen the shifts in geopolitics. You've seen the return of Russia as a global power, the rise of China as a power. Now the Russia-China alliance and a waning, some would say, United States as well. Put that into context for us, what we are seeing here and the broader implications, yes, for Ukrainians who are in the crossfire, but the broader implications for the rest of the world and the big power play. Well, the big story really is that the Americans have basically not exactly vacated the space. Yes, there'll be sanctions, but you know, sanctions, sanctions. Um, I mean, they, they were applied. They were applied after Crimea. Did it stop the Russians? Absolutely not. I don't think it will have a huge effect. It'll it'll hurt the economy of Russia. It'll hurt ordinary Russians, uh, but it won't stop uh, mm. their president doing what he's doing. And the Americans have said from the beginning and the Europeans, oh, by the way, if you do happen to invade, we're not going to stop you. We're not going to put a military block there. We'll just slap you on the wrist with sanctions. It's kind of an open invitation to and, a man like Vladimir Putin. And we know that Vladimir Putin sees that as an invitation. and We've seen this action today. The question now is, where does it go to? And we'll see this unfold, no doubt, in the coming days. Phil, it's terrific to have you you back um, to have your, your expertise and your analysis and your experience to draw on as well. And that is our program for tonight, um, this look at Putin's 
Power Play. I'm Stan Grant. Thank you so much for giving us your time. We'll continue to follow this on ABC. Bye for now.